however many documentaries they make, is going to get rid of it. Thank you. We're running late, and I know many of you uh, probably have dinner appointments, but I'm now going to um, ask for a summing up from each of the people in turn. I'm going to ask them for two minutes, summing up of what they um, uh, have thought throughout the evening. But, but while they're doing that, you will be voting, and you will have brought into the hall a card like this. Please tear it in half and vote either for or against the motion. And if you wish to abstain, then don't tear it and put the whole lot into the box. Um, people will come round with the boxes, and while they are doing that, we will hear from each of the speakers in turn. Okay? If you're going to hear them, you'll have to... Uh... You have to need a spare one. Yeah, well, it's okay. Yeah. Just... Okay. Right, before the groundswell of conversation gets too loud, I'm going to ask Christopher Hitchens to summarise what his feelings are at the end of this debate. Christopher. Um, I think I'll address myself principally to Dr Spivey, who uh, has ducked the motion not by uh, saying that religion should be transcended, or would, we would be better off if it uh, were to be, but rather like Dr Scruton has simply said, well, we can't hope to. We're stuck with it. Well, that's not what the motion says. The motion says, suppose we could, as some of us have, transcended the supernatural and the superstitious, would our example, if followed, not be a superior one? I think we've made a pretty strong case for that. Um, I'll correct him also on another point, a very common misapprehension, and I'll try and demonstrate in doing so that we are not on this side deaf to the numinous, as it were. It is flat out not true to say that Karl Marx referred to religion as an opiate or an opium. What he says, I can quote it from memory, from his uh, uh, contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, is this. He says, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, the spirit of the spiritless situation. It is an opiate for the sufferer, for the people. So he goes on to say, the demand to give up its illusion is the demand to give up the condition that requires illusions. And he closes by saying that criticism has plucked the flowers from the chain, not so that men and women may wear the chain without consolation, but so that they may break the chain and cull the living flower. Now, that the fact that you've been lied to about what he said all this time by, by religious spokesmen shouldn't uh, conceal from you the knowledge that we have a, a very clear understanding of where this impulse comes. I actually don't like the Sistine Chapel. I didn't, like it, I didn't like it even before I knew that every brick of St. Peter's was raised by the sale of indulgences, which obviously changes nothing for Dr. Scruton either, by a special sale of indulgences, by the way. But I do like the Parthenon very much, and I've written a book about it. And I think, I think of, as, as an achievement of artistic symmetry um, and architectural glory, it probably has no Christian rival. But I believe that I can. In fact, I know I can. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has been there and said and appreciated and loved it without having to subscribe to the superstitions of the Eleusinian mysteries, to the cult of Athena and Zeus, to the Melian expedition and the Peloponnesian War, to slavery and Athenian imperialism, and to human sacrifice. We can have our Parthenon, and we can indeed recover it from what was done to it by Byzantine Ottomans, by Venetian Catholics, uh, by National Socialist barbarians and many others, we can still have it. It's our common property without the superstitions that go with it, without the dread and fear and sacrifice, the, the terrified, cringing humanity that was so much sheltered uh, under the walls as it was being raised. And the word for that, the ability to have these things, to have John Milton's poetry, uh, to have Philip Larkin's uh, poem, Church Going, to have uh, Shakespeare, to have, without the superstition, is called culture, on which we've all laid our lives, on which we've all sworn to defend ourselves and our civilization against, especially now, precisely against religious barbarism, against those who know they are right, against those who say they only need one book, against those who say they know God's on their side, against those who say there's a revelation. That's what culture is, that's what we're defending. Yes, we'd be better off with culture, and yes, we can have it without religion, which is a mind 
forged manacle. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at the risk of confusing any, everyone, can I try and organise a straw vote? I mean, a hands in the air sort of vote. And can I ask you oh, to be absolutely? We're waiting. We're taking a vote right now. Really, no, no, this I is guess. something different, Joe. This is this is a, this is a question. It's not about. It could have been about who in this audience has ever shown violence against their laptop. But I, I'll use a Wittgensteinian example. <laughs> hands up, and tr don't be bashful about this. I'm going to start off putting my own hand up. Who in this room has ever, or can ever remember, kissing a photograph? What? <laughs> Slightly less than I might have anticipated, <laughs> but if you've, if you've done that, you have, be, you have behaved as, in a sense, Wittgenstein is saying, we all behave as ceremonious animals. Uh, we do things that don't have reason, uh, behind them, we do things for performance. We will go into, I don't want this to become all about um, St. Peter's in Rome, but you know there's a bronze statue <laughs> there of St. Peter, and men, so many people have touched the toe of St. Peter that the toe has almost disappeared. Depends who you're kissing. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. We do silly things. We die on behalf of a friend, and they're things that scientists can't um, explain. That is my scientific view, which I restate. My personal view and it's voiced with the glum awareness that uh, Methodist chapels are currently closing at a rate of 100 a year. Uh, one lady said over there, what um, are our children going to believe? What if the motive that William James said was the religious motive? It's uneasiness. It's all he says. It, if, when you feel uneasy and you want to connect to some sort of um, form of hope, when things become imponderable or incomprehensible, you become uneasy. You might do this by imagining a higher power or expressing yourself in this um, religious way. What if that uneasiness does indeed disappear? What if people no longer feel uneasy about the fact that there might be more to life than filling a trolley at Tesco's? It's conceivable. And at that point, I surrender, like Samuel Beckett, I sort of um, hold my hands up and say, you know, I'll go and sit in an empty church while everyone else is um, carousing and just get miserable. Um, but when the uh, next Robespierre or Stalin or Himmler organizes us into a truly irreligious society and sends me to their version of hell, one that they've created, I'm going to go there with the letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in my pocket. And yes, I'll be crooning some of those hymns that nobody croons anymore, the hymns of Charles Wesley. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>